process of creation is a complex beast. When creating, though not my only inspiration, I do sometimes get giddy at the thought of positive reception to the work I do. But something that no artist, designer, director, producer, or creative mind ever wants to think of is if the reception is negative. Criticism is necessary. It makes us think about things from a different background, perspective, or lens, and reach places that we may not be able to imagine on our own. But in this modern age of the internet, where everyone can voice their opinions with little regard for effort or context, it can be scary to be a creator. It can be scary to be perceived. But what happens when perceptions of the past get mistaken for perceptions of the internet era? What happens when myths are mistaken for fact and context is all but forgotten? What happens is you get memed years after you've already lost relevance. What happens is you get the wrongful title of worst game of all time. You become a lesson in what not to do because of course hindsight is 2020. What happens is you might just be Bubsy 3D. Hi, I'm Dana the Artist. While I usually use this channel to critique games or gush about the games that I love, today I wanted to take a little bit of a different approach. I took time this last month to play the infamous Bubsy 3D, a game that has been covered to death on YouTube already. Whether it's fake burning the game, raging about his tank controls, or complaining about Bubsy's dreaded voice, I would be putting it lightly if I said that the topic was oversaturated. And after playing the game, I had a choice. I could parody every other video on this platform, trashing the game from my privileged lens, or I could do my research and bring some nuance to the discussion. And I am so glad that I chose the latter. Because in doing a thorough investigation, I found that many complaints are knee deep, rising from short tempers and even shorter attention spans. But let's not get misconstrued. The game is not good. However, there's a lot of misinformation spread online about this Looney Tunes ass Bobcat, and I want to set the record straight. Also explaining the context and history behind Bubsy 3D and its troubled development. How a labor of love became the viral villain of the gaming community. This is how Bubsy went from accolades to the internet's punching bag. Bubsy 3D! Literally a platformer! I don't even know who the hell Bubsy is. It's just some generic cat that doesn't wear pants. Oh god! Oh god! But of course, a good idea doesn't really mean much when you're Bubsy. My first encounter with Bubsy was similar to most. If you grew up in the new millennium, watching Flash animations, YouTube top tens, and gamers with personal vendettas against particular games, you know what I'm talking about. It's no secret that one of the most meme to death games on YouTube was Bubsy 3D. But was all that memeing and pessimism warranted? I mean, sort of. To get to the bottom of it, first we gotta insert the disc. The game opens up with this highly compressed overstimulation of the senses. Bubsy Bobcat is on Rion! We'll be bumped! ADHD if it was a cutscene. The cutscene ends and you're welcome to the main menu. Bubsy is 3D in Forbidden Planet. You know, as much as these first impressions in 2024 aren't of the highest caliber, you can really feel the graphic design is my passion written all over this. What really caught my attention, however, is the Bubsy is 3D on the menu. Usually you see a game's title, uh, but the game isn't called Bubsy is 3D. It can make one wonder, what makes a statement like that so special that they had to prop it up on display? Simply put, 30 years ago, a statement like that was special in the video game industry. You saw the significance in the smash hits of the year. Mortal Kombat had been released two years at this point, and the Super Nintendo rendered radical 3D graphics with games such as 93's Star Fox, Stunt Race FX, and the smash hit Donkey Kong Country. But now, moving into 1995, the bubble was about to burst with the launch of Sony's first foray into the video game console market the PlayStation. Releasing a whole year before the Nintendo 64, the PlayStation was already making a name for itself with instant classics like Ridge Racer, NBA Jam, and Rayman. Hmm. Rayman. Rayman, along with many of the fifth generation's first titles, were sprite-based, primarily. Though, with the PlayStation being CD-based, you were able to render out better pixel art. But that's the thing. Though built in 3D, 
They weren't built with 3D in mind. But this was all about to change with the generation's first 3D platformer. But for whoever was literally going to change the game, there were two things they'd have to consider. Who was gonna do it first, and who was gonna do it right. I can safely say that my childhood was privileged. Specifically when it came to games. Uh, don't get it twisted, we was broke. But looking back on my earliest experiences with video games, I was graced with titles like Sonic Adventure 2, Crazy Taxi, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and Super Mario 64. What I didn't know when playing this game as a child was that I was playing a monumental title for its time. It was released just four years before I was even born. The truth is, I didn't really know what a bad video game was until I played Billy the Wizard for the Wii. A game pumped out for suckers like me to fight my Wiimote's motion controls and blame myself for the game's horrendous design. <laughs> so, this is all to say that I have a pretty good grasp for incredible experiences versus the less than stellar. So, I was fortunately gifted Bubsy 3D from a friend of mine. Thanks, dyslexic. What the hell is a Bubsy, though? Eidetic, before then known as Blank Berlin & Co, was founded by the namesake of their former title, Mark Blank and Michael Berlin. Mike Berlin, as he liked being referred to. After being inspired by platformer mascots like Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario, the very games that I grew up with years later, he wanted to make an icon of his own. Mike, at the time, was a writer and had worked on story-driven adventure games of the time. With a really strong desire to break out of story-driven games, when initially sharing his idea with his producer, he was at first put in a box. I approached my producer then. He said, not on your life. Go back to writing stories, that's all you know. So I said to him, uh, well, you know, what do I have to do to convince you that that's not the case? This is a man who cared so much about what he was inspired by. He spent a week playing the original Sonic the Hedgehog and wrote an analysis on what made the game great. So I went home and spent a solid week, 10 hours a day, doing nothing but playing Sonic. And then I wrote an analysis of it, and he read it, and he said, you got it, you can do it. Though there was a ton of work put in to get Bubsy realized, produced, and on store shelves, it was exactly that, a product. And Mike was very honest about that. What would you say was more or less the, the mission objective of Bubsy as a character? Mm -hmm. um, sell games? Well, okay. <laughs> There was that. I'm sorry to be base and, and nasty about all of this, but I mean, he was a character in a game and we hope to sell a ton of them. I've seen a lot of criticism thrown towards Bubsy and many mascot platformers of the time. But realistically, when we as artists or Imagineers are in the creative process, I think it's not far-fetched to say that we strive to make something that sticks. When I designed my avatar and branding for this very channel, I sketched out revision after revision until I saw something that made me go, yup, I want this on business cards. Suffice to say, if I don't criticize Sonic for doing the exact same thing, being created to sell games, I'm not gonna blame Bubsy or his creator, Mike. It was a product of its time, and it definitely stuck more than some of its other counterparts. After work on the first Bubsy and it saving its publisher, Accolade, Accolade then wanted Mike to have no part in its sequel of Bubsy 2. The developers of Bubsy 2 seemingly not having any respect for the source material, according to Mike himself. After the Bubsy game, while Bubsy 2 was going on behind my back, after Mark and I started Idetic, we went back to pitch product ideas to Accolade, who were more than receptive to us doing product for them as a development house. I walked through the Bubsy area and saw, you know, Bubsy hanging by a noose with a pencil through his <gasps> and blood dripping down his front. I said, uh, there's something wrong here. But after Bubsy 2's less than stellar reception, Accolade approached Mike again, with their tail between their legs, getting Mike on board for one more title. But he had one requirement. It had to be in 3D. Even though I've heard some not so great things about it, I have experience with all types of games. I think I'm ready to get a feel for the game myself. Okay, well, presentation isn't everything, but honestly, I've seen worse released in the last year. I actually look at this and immediately feel a sense of zaniness, and that does seem to be what they were going for, even if it's not a looker. The music, though, is something I can't be as courteous to, and this alongside sound design is nauseating, to say the least. Well, let's get to platforming.
Oh yeah, this was before the days of the analog stick, as the game released a whole year before the first DualShock controller hit the scene. D-pad it is, I guess. The only surprise I've found is that Bubsy controls like a car. Bubsy managed to control like Sonic and the Secret Rings 10 whole years before that game even dropped. Finally, something interesting. Let's not beat around the bush here though. All right, it's tank controls. Playing hopscotch with atoms and only being able to see below you aren't very intuitive camera controls, but it's not all bad. I was stunned in the first minutes of playing that Bubsy has a pretty decent ledge grab and get up animation, which I never would have expected in a game heralded as the WOT, worst of all time. Tank controls in a platformer may not be intuitive or fun to be frank. The controls are responsive, just not for the right genre, but there's still this pesky plumber that rears his ugly head in the face of any conversation regarding Bubsy 3D. The very game I grew up playing at a family friend's house all those years ago. I swear, every time someone brings up how dog shit Bubsy 3D is, even if you make a counterpoint, the follow-up will always be Mario 64. That's it. I think it's time to set the record straight. From the era of the Super FX chip, dawned the slow transition to 3D that trickled out starting with the Sega Saturn in 95. We don't need to go down that sad, sad rabbit hole though. <laughs> Nintendo had bridged the 3D gap that summer with their failed attempt at VR with the Virtual Boy, while they were in the lab cooking for one more year. Meanwhile, the Sony PlayStation released to mass success, selling more units in two days than the Sega Saturn in its whole five months. It was safe to say the interest in 3D was at an all-time high, and the proof was there that it wasn't about who did it first, it was about who did it right. I find it commendable that Mike Berlin was pretty ahead of the curve when it came to the rising tide. Still, the caveat that Bubsy's third entry had to be in 3D wasn't a safe bet. Him and his team at Eidetic had no experience with any 3D game at the time, making Accolade's next large-scale project in a dimension they weren't even familiar with. And that was a gamble. A gamble they would surely lose. E3, May 1996. Michael Berlin and Mike Blank present on behalf of Accolade, an alpha version of Bubsy 3D. At a certain point, Michael decides to take a look around and wanders to the Nintendo booth. We presented on behalf of Accolade, Bubsy 3D. And while we were displaying it, it was a, it was a good alpha, if not beta version. While at the convention, I walked around and saw Mario 64, and I said, we're in serious trouble. Yeah. Uh, not in those words, but I said, we're in serious trouble. So I went back and I found my then partner, Mark, and said, Mark, we're in serious trouble. You need to come over here and look at this. Oh, I can't, I'm busy, you know, demonstrating. I said, never mind that. Come over here and look at this. And he said, we're in serious trouble because they had an, a completely different 3D approach than we did. And I said, back to the drawing board. And he said, we can't afford it. There's a common misconception surrounding the discourse of Bubsy 3D. Super Mario 64 came out before Bubsy 3D. Crash Bandicoot as well. So why wasn't it better? There was already something they could base off of. Why were they so stubborn? How could they be so full of themselves? This is of course ignoring that they were released mere months apart. And sadly for a publisher on its last legs, delaying the game was not an option. Super Mario 64, Crash Bandicoot, and Bubsy 3D were all developed at the same time, under different circumstances. And Mike put it best in a 2015 interview with Retrovolve. Mr. Miyamoto was an employee of Nintendo. So he had all of Nintendo behind him. We were independent developers who were trying to make ends meet and ship a reasonable product. So the differences show, much to my chagrin. Unfortunately, the writing was on the wall from the outset. Bubsy 3D, though it would end up being one of the first fully 3D platformers, wouldn't be the first, and they wouldn't get it right. Super Mario 64 did both. Upon release, reviews for Bubsy were middling, some laying into it, 
but some not as much. Another classic misconception is regarding the Gold X Award on the game's box art, a prestige given to the game from a niche magazine of the time, PS Extreme. Many people still believe this to be a fake magazine and award plastered on the game to sell copies, but that's straight up not true. Even with the EGM quote at the top, it's not entirely out of context, aside from the use of the word original, admittedly. Ultra Game Players Magazine gave the game a pretty middle-of-the-road review, rating it a 6.1, stating, There's only one problem with Bubsy, and that is a crucial control problem. In order to navigate Bubsy, you have to go through great pains to get him moving in the proper direction. In a slow-paced game like Resident Evil, it's rarely a problem, but the precise control needed for a platform game isn't here. Every other problem in Bubsy stems from this one oversight. Later concluding that, it's just a shame that this flaw ruins what was obviously a very well thought out game that took a great deal of hard work to put together. A sentiment that reigns true, but a sentiment that sadly isn't shared by the vocal few that ever talk about this game. The last excerpt I want to pull from this article is this. The only other true 3D platform game is Mario 64. And to compare Bubsy 3D to the greatest video game ever made seems unfair. But the comparison must be made. The reason Mario works so well is due to the analog controller and the impeccable control the player has over Mario. When initially reading this quote, I latched onto the particular phrase, true 3D. What did he mean by this? When did Crash... I mean, Crash Bandicoot came out when it was way too late for us to do anything. I remember we were looking at Crash Bandicoot and said, Oh my gosh! You, this is a three-dimensional game? You know, we had, up to that point, we were like, No, we're doing real 3D. We're not doing cheap 2.5D. There's another game, uh, Pandemonium, was another neat quasi-3D, but really a 2D platformer on the PlayStation. And we're like, we're better than all these! We're doing real three-dimensional stuff! We're not going to compromise on that. And, you know, you look at Crash Bandicoot, we should have compromised. We should have gone low-res. We should have just put you in a little tunnel. And so suddenly, we could have had, like, our engine could have totally been capable of doing the exact stuff Crash Bandicoot was. But again, we thought, no, we're real 3D. We're not fake 3D like these others, and we'll be rewarded for it. We were not, because, of course, Mario showed the world how to do it right, and Mario came out before us. And it was too late for us to do anything about it once we saw what Mario was doing. This is Richard Hamm, a core developer on Bubsy 3D brought on in the middle of its rocky development. In this exceptional interview with Florian Nechaku Verdier, he goes into all sorts of details about Bubsy's development, inspirations, and lessons. The fundamental philosophical decision that was made early on, we were not going to cheat. This was going to be a fully three-dimensional game. And that means the Z-axis going up and down. I mean, the, when I came in to interview, they showed me beginning of the level, you were jumping around front. You had to climb up some palm trees, and then you were up on top of the palm trees jumping around. At the time, I remember being blown away. It's like, wow. I've never seen anything like this. So trying to find a way to climb up here, and now I'm up here, and I'm really getting a sense of vertigo. Like, ah, I don't want to fall and whatnot. Bubsy was fast, and there were bad guys all over the place shooting at you, and you're having to duck under the shots. And then you're trying to climb these trees, and it's like, wow, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. Because, of course, nobody had seen Mario 64 yet. I mean, again, it's just part of the overall philosophy of the game. True 3D, no matter the cost, no matter what we have to compromise. Now, in 2024, these camera controls, or lack thereof, only move when you do. What makes matters worse is when you get hurt, the camera decides to turn around for a cartoony reaction shot. But in practice, this just disorients the player and makes them get hurt again. It's easy to use jumps to your advantage, since turning is so damn slow. I end up using jumps for more freedom of movement and slow turns for getting my bearings. And really, things only get more frustrating as the levels progress. So my figuring a way around the controls isn't really a favor for the game, rather it proves my ability to adapt and exploit oversights. Oh! Oh, you can wall jump, what the f- Okay, okay, okay. The game's good, hello? After we played Mario 64, at which point it was too late for us to change anything about Bubsy, and that was heartbreaking. But we immediately realized, oh my god, we could totally, completely change the control scheme for Bubsy to mimic how this works, where, you know what, the camera is more freewheeling. It's not, you know, directly slapped on Bubsy's back. Um, you know, that players will be able to adjust as the camera moves independently. And it works! And we did that, and so, oh my god, this is 10,000 times better! Why didn't we do this? But we didn't, it was too late. When you jump, you can't see in front of you. 
you can't see very far in front of you to begin with because of a really simple oversight. This was a decision made long before I got there, decided, hey, you know what? We're gonna be special because we're gonna be high resolution. We're gonna be 640 by 480, which these days is so low resolution, you can't even get your computer monitor to go down that low. At the time, that was as good as the best PCs. And PC monitors could give you 640 by 480, but no TV ever could. They decided to have this really high resolution look that was something that I don't think any other engine was capable of doing. People didn't think the PlayStation could even do resolution that high at the time. Now the thing is, to be able to be that re high resolution, they had to really compromise a lot on all on view distance and texture detail and all kinds of stuff. And with the benefit of hindsight, it was a bad decision. This has the adverse effect of making the game a pain to navigate in a way that is engaging. And more importantly, Fun. Without having a proper guideline to base their work off of, this jump to 3D was nothing but gamble after gamble, a jigsaw, taking bits from other successful titles that made 3D work, but without imagining the consequences of those pieces being inserted into the wrong puzzle. Remember, don't forget, the original Tomb Raider's controls were more like Bubsy controls. Um, you know, we were copying the Tomb Raider controls too, where hey, up made you move forward and left and right made Laura Croft turn in place left and right. And the camera always stayed stuck on her back, just like we did. That was the way 3D was done. And we're like, okay, well, we're not gonna reinvent the wheel here when we should have. And, and uh, Mario 64 did. If you're going to you know base your game around the way other games work, pick the right games. Jumping Jack Flash works because it's a first person shooter that does some neat platforming stuff. And so I thought, oh, well it works here. Let's uh, make a three dimensional game. It's so annoying every time you jump in Bubsy how the camera pans up. But if you look, it's doing the exact same camera pan that Jumping Jack Flash did. In 3D, Mario proved you didn't need to do that. Players can see where you are. All you need is a little circle on the ground to kind of get a sense for where you're gonna land. A lot of the myths and misconceptions I've already pointed out remain in YouTube videos of old as reminders. But there was one criticism I have yet to bring up. That dreaded voice. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Uranus! Was it something I said? What could possibly go wrong? Lonnie Manella voices everything in this game. One of her first roles, in fact. She would later reprise the original and best voice of Rouge the Bat, Lucas and Pitt in Brawl. And the assist trophy for Lynn. I still have a soft spot for her Pitt voice. I have to say, as much as Bubsy is fucking obnoxious, and personally, I'd say not really likable, once you play the game, you'll notice that he doesn't even babble as much as people complain that he does, mainly for tutorial segments in the start. I still find most modern open world protagonists way more annoying and obnoxious than Bubsy was. Glowing lights. This must be the Zenith base. Looks like they had a shield around the entire place. Of course, they'd make their base on their own private island. Hold on, beta. I can't <laughs> Did I just do that? I did not just do that. I just moved shit with my mind. I just moved shit with my mind. I just moved shit with my freaking mind! When he does have something to say, it's triggered by something in the environment. Whether that be the classic arrow line. Oh look! An arrow! Aren't these game designers wonderful? Or look out below when floating. A platforming repertoire from the first two installments. Or a one-liner when successfully landing a hit on a boss. Ultimately, I think Bubsy's voice and inflections come across as annoying, but it's not a result of bad voice acting or oversaturation, but rather overstimulation with a wacky soundtrack and rough sound design. Ultimately, the voice direction could have been better. But my opinion wasn't enough. I needed insight. I needed a more thorough examination and I needed answers. So I went to Bubsy himself, and by that I mean the voice actor, Lonnie Manila. Hi Dano. It's so interesting the interest people have taken in Bubsy. I was flown up to the Bay Area to do his voice. They played me a snippet of a really annoying voice and wanted me to match it. I was shocked because it was the kind of voice that not only hurt my ears doing it, but I felt it would really be annoying to anyone else listening to it. As is usually the case in game voiceover recording, I wasn't told anything about the game, but recorded whatever the lines were. At one point I said, are you sure you want it to be this projected and annoying? They said yes. And thus, you know how it came about. With this information, I had to ask, if you could redo the voice in a new game with different direction, would you? Is there a character voice you've done since that you think would be more in line to fit Bubsy while not being projected and annoying? Her response was, yes, 
I'm sure I could come up with something original, not regurgitate a character from another project. The Brooklyn accent was their idea too, wise guy. Annoying was fine. While I'm on the topic of sound design and voice acting, I'd quickly like to take this time to also clear the air about Rob Paulson being ashamed of his reprisal of Bubsy in the cartoon. It's a pretty standard vocal delivery by him, and he actually went to Twitter replying to someone's retweet of a fun fact. The main menu music in tandem with a static image of high poly Bubsy heed warning of the discomfort on its way. But it's a cartoony game centered in space around a quippy cat and silly woolly alien creatures, which makes the more ugly sounding bouncy rhythms feel like you are a bouncing cat in a circus more or less the game's energy. But as the game proceeds, once you reach the first water level, Das Bobcat, you see more of the musician's range. You know, when your ears aren't already getting blasted by the rugged sound design. Songs like Zot's Nice have a dance rhythm, a la battle music from Super Mario RPG. Bright Light Big Woolies is another banger, just a sweet arrangement that is changing every measure. Which works, as at this later point in the game, things are getting more challenging and chaotic, as if they weren't already. To say that the reception of Bubsy 3D was all yarn balls and atoms would be disingenuous. Of course, as we hit the 2010s, the rise of YouTube and online gaming commentary comedy channels, many of which are still inspiration for the content you are watching right now, subscribe by the way, you start to see the discussion shift from those of context-sensitive, merciful opinions to the black and white juxtaposed stance of the modern age. Even still, back in the mid-90s, the harsh criticisms almost made Mike Berlin leave the industry altogether. Obviously, there's the classic annoyance that most people bring up. The tank controls, the grading art style, nightmarish music, stupid little quips. But as you go deeper, honestly, these are all small pieces that make a mediocre game feel like a slog. Which I think is why people really hate the game a little more than is necessary. In terms of pre-release footage that's available, there's not much. I was only able to find a Warner sneak preview for titles coming out that year, which has Brandy's Sunny Day playing in the background not only giving the footage a laid back, less chaotic vibe than what would end up releasing, but also introducing me to a dope album. So thanks Bubsy 3D. A question I bring up with games as infamous as this is, is it worse to have a game that is painfully mid, boring and completely forgettable or a game that is ambitious, unforgettable for all the wrong reasons, and fails at almost everything it tries to do. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, but in the case of Bubsy 3D, it's more of the latter. The framework for a decent game is here, but this smorgasbord of ideas doesn't come together to make something coherent, and thus it may still remain an in infamy forever. But I hope with this video, I could set some records straight, teach you something. God knows I sure learned a lot, and maybe I could make you think about something a little differently today. You don't have to like it, but you should respect it. It's the old saying that everyone forgets what you did right, they only notice everything you do wrong. But not everyone. As in the process of research, reaching out and writing for this video, I got in touch with a fantastic and wholesome community, with a love for the wacky and respect for the infamous. In the early stages of this video, I suffered the loss of my grandma. She was a very special human being with a bond that we shared being a love for video games. In my younger years, I would play her DS games like Mystery Case Files Millionaire and Brain Age. She wasn't my blood relative, but she loved me, my brothers, and my mom like we were. And I'm so grateful to have had someone like that in my life. I'd never call myself an empath, but I'm definitely someone who finds value in art, love, emotion, passion, the things that make life, life. And that's the purpose of this channel, to celebrate those things in the best way that I know how, personally. So I would like to dedicate this episode of Danologues and this mini documentary to her and the man that this story is adjacently about, the creator of Bubsy, Mike Berlin. Unfortunately, a little over a year ago, Michael Berlin passed away, and finding that out after listening to an hour-long interview from Dr. Clue, once again, thank you for help on this video, realizing that someone made something so universally hated, but always put his best foot forward and took criticism like a god, that shit inspired me. I'll never get to interview Mike Berlin. I'll never get to tell him that even though it wasn't for me, 
I like, respect, and appreciate his work and the effort he put in. That his ideas and creativity had value, it had purpose. And if we had more compassionate, honest dreamers, people like Mike Berlin, maybe the industry would be a bit better. I respected Mike, and yo, I considered Mike to be a mentor, and I still remember one of the most valuable moments of my professional career ever. I don't remember what it was, but I was pitching Mike on, hey, we need to make this change to do this, so this can become this thing instead. And I, I went into his office already, I got all my arguments made, and I was gonna you know, really make a big impassioned speech and all that, and I got, I don't know, like 30 seconds into it, and he said, okay, okay, you've convinced me. And to me, that was such a powerful moment that he would listen to me, even though I had no experience, didn't know what I was doing, but he would, he would consider me enough of an equal to take my ideas on board and change his own mind about stuff. I thought he was a great guy. I knew his, him and his wife, Muffy. My wife and I, we had dinner at his place one time, and he was just a sweet, charming guy, which is nothing but story after story after story. I, I, mean, I, I can't imagine what a blow it had to be for him personally, because of course, yeah, I, once you get once you get when you're told that hey you made the worst video game of all time well heavy wears the crown it's not like it's my fault i was just a junior guy it's not like it was the animators fault everybody loved the animation it's not like the coders fault they did the best they could and they delivered what they were supposed to but mike you know he had to bear it all he was the director he was the lead designer he was the you know he was the heart and soul of the game he created bubsy and at the time the original bubsy was considered to be a sonic killer and so it was such it, i can't even imagine how heartbreaking it must have been for him but kudos to him he just picked himself up and got back to work i'll be honest with you for all of the years that i've made product nobody has ever said they liked anything that I've done. I've never gotten an email or a fan letter from a flounder or, you know, nothing. And, and I have sat here in isolation, continuing to make product that I wanted to make that I thought would be fun for people and never heard anything. And, and I certainly haven't hidden from people. So the fact that there are people out there who like Bubsy, who still like Bubsy, who enjoyed Bubsy when he first came out or any of the variations thereof, or saw the Bubsy cartoon, I'm awestruck. I really am. I can only say thank you. It was a very special relationship. He was a mentor. And you know, people say, a mentor? The mentor, the guy who made Bubsy 3D, that's the worst game of all time. That'd be the worst mentor ever. But no, he um, he really taught me a lot about how to work with people and how to listen to people and how to just be a, a, a good person. And, a, and a, So I've got nothing but nice things to say about Mike. Thank you for watching. And thank you to everybody who has helped on this video. Lonnie Manella for the interview. Florian for the use of his interview with Richard Hamm, Dr. Clue for the use of his interview with Mike Berlin, Buck for the animation, Jared for cinematography and direction, and Dyslexic Player for introducing me to this silly ass game. He got it from a secondhand store, so that's why he, he, he made this art too. He, you know, go, go check him out. Thanks Dyslexic Player, very cool. Thank you for watching. All of my sources are in the description. And lastly, thank you to my patrons moxie as well as the chad amongst virgins y guy <laughs> thanks for watching